Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review, and today we're talking about the shit Folkfanger here. Now this is an unusual review because at the time that I'm actually recording this, there might be just a few units left of these to purchase, so this is not one of those reviews where you might listen to this and then say, yes, this is the amp I want and go and buy it, because the chances are it's already gone. If you're not familiar with the Folkfanger, this is a bit of a crazy product from the guys over at Shit Audio, and what they've done here is put together 10 tubes in a single amplifier that's not even that powerful, but that comes with a pretty unique design that I want to talk about shortly. Before I get into those details though, let me give you a quick snapshot of what this is about. This is an 1800 US dollar tube amp, as I said before. It's specifically an OTL and OCL amp, meaning that there is literally nothing between your headphones and the actual outputs of the tubes themselves. Now, normally in an amplifier, you've either got capacitors or you've got transformers between your headphones and the tubes. And so this is truly unique. And that was a big part of why I wanted to grab one and see how it sounded. I'll talk more about the technicalities of it in just a second, but let me start by showing you the Folkfanger in all its glory. I think the best way to introduce the Folkvanger is to give you a quick tour of the device. And there's not a huge amount to see, but what I'm going to do is use this as an opportunity to share with you some of the technologies, the key features, some of the specifications along the way. Before we start the tour, I should mention one spec that's not going to be covered by the tour, and that is the power output of this. The Folkvanger is really optimized for high impedance loads. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But what it means is the Folkvanger is going to output 1.2 watts into a 300 ohm load, and that is absolutely heaps for most 300 ohm headphones out there. But on the flip side, it's only going to give you 300 milliwatts into 32 ohm loads. And that's actually really quite low and quite modest compared to most of the solid state amps on the market. And that all comes back around to the design of this as an OTL, OCL amp. And I will explain that more in a minute. But the key takeaway is that this is really an amp designed specifically for high impedance headphones. There's been a few things done to make it work better with low impedance, but as I'll talk about shortly, it's not really at its very best there. And so let's now start the tour. Looking at the front of the device, things are seemingly very simple. We've got a 6.3mm output, so yes, this is a single ended only amplifier, as basically all tube amps are. We've got a volume knob over here, which is just a straightforward volume knob. This does have preamp capability, so it's also worth noting that that's the volume for both your headphones and your preamp. It's also a muting preamp. What I mean by that is that when you plug in your headphones, it automatically switches off the rear outputs, which is great. And then from there, we've got three toggle switches. The first switch will choose between the two RCA inputs on the back. So you've got input one, input two. The next switch is a gain switch, but it's also an output impedance switch. And so let me pause and talk about this for a moment. The way the Folkfanger has been designed is that switching this switch basically changes the way the tubes are connected within the circuit, and that's going to give you both more power in high gain, but also more output impedance too. If you're not familiar with output impedance, what that means is that basically how hard it is for the amplifier circuit to push the voltage and the current out through the headphone socket. The traditional rule of thumb is that you want your output impedance to be about one eighth of whatever the headphone load is you're plugging in. So for instance, if you had an 80 ohm headphone, you'd want an output impedance of no more than 10 ohms. In the case of the Folkfanger, the low gain, low output impedance mode has a 7 ohm output impedance. So that's pretty good. That means anything from about 60 ohms upwards, you're going to be working pretty well. And I'll also explain later what happens if you go above that 1 8 rule. But then if we talk about the high output impedance and high gain mode, then we're jumping up to an 18 ohm output impedance, which if you multiply that by 8, you're getting to over 100 ohms for your recommended headphone load. And that all comes back around in terms of what pairs well with the Folkvanger and what doesn't so much. But there are a few things to it, and rather than dumping all of the technical information here in one lump, what I'm going to do is spread it out as it's relevant. So for now, let's just say that in low gain mode, you're getting less amplification of the signal, so it's about a 1.5 times the input. 
and you're getting a 7 ohm output. When you go to the high gain mode or the high output mode, you're then getting about 6.5 times amplification of the input signal, and it's giving you also that 18 ohm output. And so we'll come back around later and talk about what that means with specific headphone pairings. But before we get there, I want to talk about another switch, and that's this final one here, which is for the impedance multiplier. What the impedance multiplier is doing is it's putting a solid state circuit within the signal path somewhere. I don't know exactly how it's implemented, but what it's intended to do is essentially present the amplifier with what looks like a higher impedance load. So it's going to be more happy driving into that. And in the meantime, what it's doing is allowing your lower impedance headphones to work more effectively. I'll talk about how that translates to actual sound performance and power performance with some specific headphones later, but I think it's a pretty cool idea. What it translates to in terms of power delivery is it means that the Falkvanger with the impedance multiplier switched on can actually go from putting out just 300 milliwatts into 32 ohms up to 1.4 watts. It'll also drop the output power for 300 ohms back down to 1.2 watts, but that's still plenty. So it's a really cool feature, but we do need to talk about what it does to the sound, which is minimal, but is different. Moving on from the front panel now, and it's important to talk about the tubes on top of the Falkvanger here. We've got a total of 10, as I said before, but exactly how they're laid out is kind of important. The front two are preamp tubes, so that's essentially processing the signal when it first comes into the amp, and the other eight at the back are your actual power tubes. And the reason this is important is if you do decide to do any tube rolling, or if eventually you have to replace any tubes, it's kind of important to understand what's doing what. It'll also become relevant a little bit later when I talk about a little bit of tube rolling that I've done. And the reason this is important is that the front two tubes, the preamp tubes, do need to be a matched pair, ideally. Obviously you can technically run it without them being matched, but it's better if they are. Whereas the back eight tubes don't have to be matched. So if you are looking for replacement tubes, you can actually just buy any batch of eight tubes or more than eight tubes and plug in whichever ones you want, no problems at all. I don't know this for sure, and I didn't specifically ask Jason this in my recent interview with him, but my understanding with the back tubes is that they're probably being run in a combination of parallel or series arrangements, meaning that they're either connected one after the other or kind of alongside each other. And that's going to change exactly how they're being used, but it's also going to balance out differences in their matching levels. And so the takeaway for you is that you only need to worry about matching the front two for the preamp. They're six N1P tubes. You can also use six DJ8s, and I'll talk to you about some other tubes as well that a channel patron sent through. And then for the rear tubes, these are six N6P tubes, and there's a good reason to probably not roll these. And that is because they've been very carefully chosen by Jason Stoddard, who's the designer of the amp, by the way. He chose them specifically for their low output impedance. And that's really relevant here because we don't have a transformer between the tubes and the headphone output to balance off the output impedance. And if you do use other tubes, like the ones I'm going to talk about in a little while, what you're potentially doing is throwing the output impedance way, way higher, and that's going to affect the headphones that you can and can't effectively use. And so keep that one in mind. We're going to come back around, talk a bit more about the tubes later. But the key thing is to remember we've got two preamps at the front and eight regular power tubes at the back. Now I'm not going to try and turn the Falkvanger around because there's not much to see on the back. What I'm going to tell you though is that over on the far side there is a regular full-size mains connector, what they call an IEC connector, and that's also got a power switch embedded into it. One thing that might be worth noting, it's not a big deal, but it's worth noting that it does have a bit of play. I've chatted to a couple of patrons that also own the Falkvanger, and they've said the same thing about theirs, so it seems to be a common thing. There's a little bit of movement. There are plastic housing that these IEC connectors sit within, and I'm guessing that there's just a bit more tolerance there than we'd like, so there's a bit of wobble and a bit of wiggle in that connector. Once it's plugged in and switched on, it really doesn't matter, but while we're talking about power switches, this is absolutely an amp that I think should 100% have had a front power switch. It's an amp that absolutely needs to be switched on and off regularly because it's got the tubes in it. And so for me, I think it's again a bit of a shame that shit didn't make an exception on this one and put a toggle switch somewhere on the front. It's again not a huge deal, but this is an amp that deserved a front power switch. Moving on from that though, because what's done is done, and over on this end of the amp, we've got three RCA sockets. You've got two different inputs, and you've got one pair of preamp outputs. And the preamp works really nicely. I've used this a bit driving my active monitors and my active speakers, and it works just fine. It's not the most quiet amp in the world, so depending on your setup, you might hear a tiny bit of noise from it, but it's been generally really good with everything I've used it with. And I should actually mention that the choice of tubes you make will play a part into how much noise or how much hum the amp creates. And so we'll come back around to that when I talk about tube rolling in just a little while. Before we get there, let me cover off one final thing about the specifications of this, and then we're going to move into sound quality. And the specifications I want to talk about are the fact that this is not an amp built for measurement freaks. 
It's got really high total harmonic distortion. The crosstalk figures aren't great. And crosstalk is the ability for the left channel and the right channel to bleed together a little bit. That can have benefits and drawbacks. Obviously, if you've got very low crosstalk, you're keeping really good left-right separation and you're going to get a really good stereo sound field. But if you've got a lower crosstalk figure, it can actually work a little bit like crossfeed. So if you're listening to headphones, you're not going to get quite as much of a hard pan effect. And that can sometimes help to produce a better central image. So I'm not going to say it's better or worse. It's just things to be aware of. But from here, let's jump into sound quality, because if you're buying a Folkvanger, that's really what it's all about. And I want to revisit as part of sound quality the design of this, the fact that it's an OTL, OCL amplifier, and I want to explain what that means from a sonic perspective. So the reason that Jason and Mike, who was also involved in this design, I believe, the reason they went for an amplifier like this was because they talked before about doing their own transformers for transformer coupled amps. And the reason you would do that is because it allows you to control the impedance of the output and better match it to a whole lot of different headphones. The problem with that is that output transformers have their own inherent problems, and they're a big chunk in the signal path between you and the sound coming out of the tubes. And so Jason's idea was to go OTL, which is output transformerless, but then to go a step further, where most OTL amps will have capacitors after the tubes and before your headphones, he wanted to go direct connection to the tubes, which is a little bit crazy because if you have any issue with the tubes, you're potentially putting the sorts of signals through your headphones that could destroy them. And so there's been a lot of effort put into the protection circuit that's going to shut down the output, rather than actually putting something into the output path as I understand it. And the end result of that is something a little bit magical. And I'm not sitting here suggesting this is the best amp you're ever going to hear. It's absolutely not. But what it does is something I've not heard from any other amps. And keep in mind, I haven't actually dabbled with really high-end OTL amps, so I can't compare it directly to, say, a Felix Audio high-end OTL amp, or even the Bottlehead Cracker Tour that I was really hoping to have built by the time I did this review, but there's been some hiccups with that. Due to a parts issue, it wasn't Bottlehead's fault at all. I want to make that really clear, and I'll explain that much more when I get to that review. But just to be clear, I can't compare this directly to OTL, Definitely in comparing it to two high-end amplifiers that I have here, which are both transformer coupled tube amps. In both of those cases, this is doing something that neither of those can do. And it's delivering a sense of transparency. Not transparency in the sense of being completely invisible in the source chain, but giving you a connection to the sound that I don't get from any other amps. There's a fluidity from the tubes. There's a naturalness from the tubes that's just effortless and easy, and I've only ever heard it from an amp like the Folkvanger, and potentially, as I said before, some of the really high-end OTL amps. And don't worry, if you are wondering specifically how it compares to a high-end OTL amp, I will be comparing it to the Bottlehead Cracker Tour once I get that up and running properly. For now though, let me give you some more specific details about the sound of the Folkvanger. And the first thing I want to say is that it's got a rich and smooth sound, but to me it's not overly thick. It does definitely benefit from a crisper, cleaner sounding DAC, so something like the Hugo TT2 is a marvellous match with it, whereas something like the shit Yggdrasil is a little bit too much. You've got a fairly full-bodied and punchy DAC in the Yggdrasil, paired up with the Folkvanger here, it's just a bit too much of a good thing. And so there is no doubt that it is a rich, smooth sounding amp, but the thing I wanted to clarify is it's not muddy or slow. It's just got a fullness to the sound, but it's still got a good sense of articulation and clarity within that richer, fuller sound. And in many ways, it's like a good OTL amp in that regard. What that generally means is that the bass from the Folkvanger is a little bit less tight than, say, a top-end solid-state amp. So if I went between, say, the TT2 headphone output and the Folkvanger running with the TT2 as the DAC, what I heard was not a significant shift in the overall tonality. So it wasn't like there was more bass or more or less treble. It was more the qualities of those things. So the bass was not as tight from the Folkvanger. It became a little bit looser, a little bit slower, not really slow, but just a little bit in comparison to the TT2. And the treble was a bit smoother overall. So it was all still there, it was just a bit smoother overall in character. And so depending on the headphones you pair it with, some headphones need the bite, some are better without the bite, it's all going to depend on the pairings. Comparing it to my other tube amps, which I alluded to before, putting it up next to something like my Elekit 2U8200R, which is a high-quality transformer-coupled amp, and I've got some high-end tubes in there, such as a pair of NOS Shuguang Black Treasure KT88s and a pair of NOS Sylvania 12AU7s. Putting it up next to that setup, which is significantly more expensive by the time you factor in the build time, because it's a kit that I built myself, and the cost of tubes... Putting those two back to back, there was no doubt that the 8200R was more resolving. It was also more neutral. It didn't have as much coloration as the Folkvanger had. 
but it wasn't like they were world apart, and there were certainly characteristics to the Falkfanger sound that could be preferable. And specifically, one of the characteristics I'm talking about is that kind of sense of transparency I spoke about before. And I mean the transparency in terms of that fluidity, that ease of the sound. With the transformer coupled amps that I tried, being the 8200R and my Bottlehead Mainline, both of those had a very slight kind of edge or sense of extra clarity in the treble. And so it's almost like the Fogfanger gives you a more pure connection to the music in some ways, whilst also having a little bit of colour added. Whereas the transformer coupled amps, it's almost like they're tweaking the signal a little bit, like turning up the clarity a little bit, enhancing the signal, altering the signal slightly. So both have their pros and cons. I'm not suggesting one is better or worse. And for me, I love that wonderful sense of connection to the music that I feel the Fogfanger gives. Let's move on now, though, from my general comments and start talking about some headphone pairings to put into perspective both how this sounds across the board with different headphones, but also which headphones work well and not so well with the Falkvanger. In many cases with a headphone amp like this, there's not going to be clear-cut answers as to which headphones are good and bad with the Falkvanger, so much as giving you a sense of what is going to tilt in what direction sonically and therefore which ones you might prefer. There are a couple of headphone pairings where I'd say I really wouldn't do it with the Falkvanger, but across the board for most of it, it's more about whether you're going to prefer the sound or not prefer the sound. For a lot of this testing, I was using the same track, which is Times Are Wasting by Erika Badu, but I used other tracks as well as I went through the mix. And the first headphone I'm going to talk about is the ZMF Atrium. The ZMFs are a wonderful option with the Falkvanger because they're 300M headphones and they all pair beautifully with the high output impedance that the Falkvanger has. With the Atrium, the sound is immediately thick and engaging, and I mean thick in a good way. It's got body, it's got presence, it's got warmth. It's certainly not the most hi-fi sound I've ever heard, but it's so incredibly enjoyable. And in fact, I'd go so far as saying the Atrium combination with the Falkvanger can be wildly enjoyable. And so for me, the Atrium is kind of my baseline for just how good the Falkvanger can sound. It almost sounds like the Falkvanger was tuned with the Atriums in mind, and I'm sure that wasn't the case, but it's definitely a match made in heaven. That said, some people will find the bass a bit too much with the pairing of the Atrium and the Falkvanger, because the Falkvanger's slightly less tight bass, plus the nice, rich, full sound of the Atrium can go too far depending on the track and depending on your preferences. Now you can tweak that a little bit by flicking between the low impedance and the high impedance output, or the low gain and the high gain, it's the same thing. So you can tighten it a little bit by going into low gain, but I definitely felt like the Falkvanger and the Atriums sounded best in that high output mode. While we're talking ZMFs, let's also talk about the Verite Opens. And the Verite Opens have a naturally faster, snappier sound because of their beryllium driver, and I found that the Verite gave them a better sense of thump and punch than they get from some solid state amps. Indeed, the Verite Open isn't always my favourite choice of headphone because it can be a little bit too fast sometimes. And the Fogfanger helps to tame that a little bit. It helps to give it a bit more sense of body and decay and fullness without detracting from the general character of the Verites. I probably still slightly prefer the Atrium overall with the Fogfanger, but the Verites come very, very close. And that's really where the magic of the Fogfanger is for me, is it helps to bring that fullness and that life to a very fast headphone. And so if you do have a very fast headphone that you're looking to tame a little bit, or you've got something that's a bit dry, a bit analytical, maybe an HD800 or an HD800S, the Falkvaker could be a fantastic choice, particularly if they're high impedance headphones. I'll talk in just a second about some lower impedance dynamic headphones, but I just want to wrap up by saying I think the Falkvanger and the Verite Open are a wonderful, wonderful match. So if you are somebody with a Falkvanger and you're thinking about a headphone to buy, do consider the Verite Opens as well as the Atriums, depending on what your preference is. So if you want that cleaner, faster sound, then go with the Verite Open. If you want that full, rich, and just purely emotional sound, then I think the Atriums are the choice. But now what if we go to a lower impedance headphone? I've recently been able to pick up a pair of Focal Clear MGs, so this is the new version of the Focal Clear, and plugging that into the Falkvanger in the low impedance output mode, the sound was definitely very articulate, very smooth, the bass is punchy and quite tight, and it was generally a very enjoyable listen. Overall though, some people may find that it's getting a bit too full and a bit too rich, and so it's going to depend on what you want. I used to find with the original Focal Clears that they actually benefited from a tube because they've got that slightly metallic, very slightly aggressive top end, whereas the new Clear MGs don't have that, and I'll be giving them a full review soon, so I'll cover that off in there. But to me, the Clear MGs don't really need the Falkvanger. It sounds nice with them, but it's not a headphone that I would absolutely say benefits from a tube amp like the Falkvanger, and so I'd say it's an enjoyable listen, but it's not one that I would jump to. What it did allow me to do, though, was test the impedance multiplier switch, and it was interesting hearing what it did. With a headphone like the Clear MG, we're getting down below the headphone impedance that's ideal for the output impedance of the headphone amp. 
So remember before I said that ideally you want your headphone to be about eight times the output impedance. And so we're starting to stretch the limits of that with the Focal Clear MG. And what that tends to do is it tends to make the sound a little bit looser. So if you're starting to get anything less than about that eight times rule, and this is not a hard and fast rule, it's more of a guiding principle. But when you start to get an impedance on the headphone that is less than eight times the output impedance, what you'll generally find is two things happen. Firstly, it can start to alter the frequency response of the headphone. And that can be hard to predict because every headphone is a little bit different. It all depends on the impedance characteristics of the headphone, the natural resonance of the headphone as to which frequency is going to change and how. But then the other thing that it can do is it can change the damping factor. And the damping factor is how effectively the amplifier can start and stop the driver. As you lose damping factor, the driver becomes a bit looser. It's easier for it to kind of flop around a little bit. And what that means is that when you plug in a headphone like the Focal Clear MG to the Folkvanger, you are getting a slightly slower, slightly looser sound because of that impedance mismatch. And so whilst it's enjoyable with the Folkvanger, I don't know that I'd say it's preferable to what I hear from a good transformer coupled tube amp or a solid state amp. And then that's where the impedance multiplier switch comes in. And flicking back and forth between the two, what I really heard was that by putting the impedance multiplier switch on, it was cleaning up the transients a little bit. And so the transients are those leading edges of notes. It's the, the strum of a guitar. It's the hit of a drumstick on a drum or a cymbal. And I feel like with the impedance multiplier switch on, it was giving each of those transients a better sense of definition. Generally speaking, I think the circuit is pretty transparent. It doesn't do a lot of damage to what you're hearing. I know some people are going to say, it's a pure tube amp. Why are we putting something solid state into the signal path? And I think generally should have done a very good job of making it as transparent as possible. But it does do two things. Firstly, it does kind of sharpen up those transients, I think in a positive way, with a low impedance headphone. But what it's also doing, I noticed, is it's flattening the soundstage a little bit. You do lose a little bit of depth. So when you flick it on and off, it's like the soundstage goes from being this deep in total to coming just a little bit more forward and flattening things out a bit. It's not drastic and you've got to really listen for it to hear it, but it's definitely changing it. In case you're wondering if you run the clear MGs with high output impedance from this, it is going to make them a bit loose and a bit boomy in the bass, which some people might love, but for me it was a bit too much of a good thing. And so I decided to move on from dynamic driver headphones, having concluded that for me the Folkvanger is absolutely at its best with higher impedance dynamic headphones, but can absolutely work well with lower impedance ones as well. According to my recent interview with Jason Stoddard where we were mostly talking about digital, there have been a lot of people saying that the Folkvanger is a fantastic match for Grados or Grados. That's something I haven't tried directly so I can't comment on, but it does tell us that maybe the key is about the dynamic drivers in general working well with this rather than necessarily being high impedance. And that makes sense because a 7 ohm output impedance isn't crazy. It's a little bit higher than is ideal, but it's certainly not off the planet. And there are plenty of dynamic driver headphones that start to get up to around that sort of 50 to 60 ohm mark where things are starting to balance out with that 1 8th rule. And so let's leave dynamic driver headphones here and start talking planers. Generally speaking, people will tell you that tube amps don't go well with planers, and that's not entirely true, particularly if it's a transformer coupled tube amp. But it is somewhat more true when we're talking an OTL amp like the Folkvanger here. And that's because tubes are not good at creating current, and most planar magnetics have lower impedances. So the lower the impedance, the more current is required to drive the voltage into the headphone. And so I ran through four different planar magnetic headphones to see how they played with the Folkvanger. And the first one's the Mesa Elite, which is a very easy headphone to drive in general. It hasn't got crazy low impedance, and it's also fairly sensitive. And I'd say that it sounds fine, but it's really not a great pairing. It's not an issue with power delivery, I think it's just a, a synergy thing. So the Elite is such an open, transparent, and clean sounding headphone, that when you put it on something like the Folkvanger, it kind of comes off sounding a bit congested, and a bit closed in relative to what I'm used to hearing from a great solid state, or some other tube amps. And so for me, whilst you could run an Elite from the Folkvanger, it's not a pairing I'd recommend, so I moved on pretty fast. Something else I tried, because it happened to have come in while I had the Folkvanger here, is the DCA Expanse, and don't even bother trying to drive that with the Folkvanger. I tried lots of different configurations, and because of the low impedance of the Expanse, and the relatively high output impedance of the Folkvanger, it was running out of power in the low gain mode, which has the low output impedance, but then when I went to the high output mode and switched on the impedance multiplier, it kept triggering the protection mode of the Folkvanger. I'm not entirely sure why that was happening. It hasn't happened with any other headphone, only the Expanse. But the long and the short of it is it's just not a pairing I'd recommend. Don't even bother. And the same is true for Sasvara. So if you've got a really difficult to drive planar magnetic, there is absolutely no point bothering to try it with the Folkvanger. Stick to solid state or maybe transform a couple tube amps. And so I quickly moved on from the Expanse and reached for another favourite of mine, which is the Sandy Peacock. 
The Peacock isn't particularly hard to drive, it's probably comparable to the Elite in many ways. And it sounded lovely from the Folkvanger, probably not its best, I probably heard it better from the Solar State amp, but it definitely was enjoyable still. One of the things I love about the Peacock is it's got this beautiful kind of delicate and articulate sound to it, and I think the extra sense of bassfulness from the Folkvanger probably detracted a little bit from the overall sound of the Peacocks, and so that's where I'm saying it wasn't at its very best, but it certainly worked completely fine. So if you do have a headphone like the Peacock, i.e. a moderate impedance, fairly easy to drive planar, you can absolutely run it with the Folkvanger, no problems at all. You've got the low output impedance mode and all the impedance multiplier switch, so you can go for your life and give it a try. But again, I didn't feel like it was getting the best out of the Peacock, and that's probably once again a synergy thing, more so than an inability of the Folkvanger to provide enough power in terms of voltage and current. And so the final headphone I wanted to try was something that sits in the middle, and that's the Hi-Fi-Man Aria Stealth Edition. This is a headphone that often gets touted as being difficult to drive, and in my experience, it's not particularly true. It's not the easiest planer to drive for sure, it is harder than the Peacock, it's harder than the Elites, but it's not like a Susvara, or even like a DCA Expanse or Stealth. And so I plugged it into the Folkvanger and gave it a go, and just to put things in perspective, the Folkvanger was giving me very good listening levels at about 11 o'clock on the dial, and only in low impedance mode, which is therefore also the low gain mode. So you've got plenty of power on tap here, it's not even starting to push the headphone amp to its extremities, and it sounded nice. I felt like the power delivery was improved with the impedance multiplier switched on, but as I said, it also changes the character of the sound just a little bit, it flattens the stage a tiny bit, and it feels a little bit less easy. I talked before about that sort of sense of transparency, or realism, or fluidity that the Folkvanger has in its more pure setup, and I do feel like the impedance multiplier switch just robs it of a little bit of that. And it was very evident with something like the Aria. It didn't sound bad, and indeed both configurations had their own pros and cons. But it showed me that the impedance multiplier isn't completely transparent. You can hear what it's doing, and it's not always beneficial, but it's great that you've got it there. You can switch it off if you don't want it. Interestingly, I also tried the high gain mode, and once again it worked beautifully with the Arias. There were no issues at all with power. The sound was basically unchanged. And that suggests once again what I've often suspected, which is that planar magnetic headphones, because they have a consistent impedance across all frequencies, aren't really affected by the output impedance of the headphone amp. The only problems that you've got is the inefficiency of power delivery. So if you've got a low impedance headphone and a high output impedance amp, the amp actually loses a lot of the power in the transfer between the impedances. So you might run out of power, that is an issue, but you're not losing quality of the sound if the amp is still running within its comfortable range. And that was true for me with the Folkvanger and the Aria Stealth, and indeed it was a pairing that I quite enjoyed. So at the end of all my headphone rolling, where I've landed is that the Folkvanger is realistically an amp that I'm only going to use with 300 ohm type headphones. Maybe some other dynamics as they come in I'll give them a try, but it's at its very, very best with things like the ZMF Atrium, the ZMF Verite, no doubt the Sennheiser HD800s and similar headphones like that, all of those are going to work an absolute treat with the Folkvanger. And so if you do end up buying one, whether it's one of the last new ones or a second hand one, I would say buy it with those sorts of headphones in mind. Anecdotally, it sounds like Grados are a great choice as well, and certainly the older Focals are going to be great with it based on my previous experiences, so do consider it for those sorts of setups, but be aware that it's probably not the best choice for those of you looking for a clean, crisp, planar magnetic sound, and that some planers seem to work better with it than others, I'm not entirely sure what the technicalities are as to why, maybe it's just the tonality of those planers. With something like the Aria being a little bit brighter to start with, it probably balances off better with the slight richness and warmth of the Folkvanger. But for me, where the magic is, is absolutely those 300 ohm ZMFs. And so let's park the headphone rolling now and talk about tube rolling in case you're interested in tinkering with the tube selections. As I said before, we've got two different sets of tubes within the Folkvanger. You've got the 6N1 piece at the front, which should be matched. You've got the 6N6 piece at the back, which don't need to be matched. And very importantly, there are reasons that both sets of these tubes have been chosen. In the case of the back tubes, the power tubes, they've been chosen for their very low output impedance. And that's definitely something to keep in mind. In the case of the front tubes, there's a number of benefits that I found when I started looking into the 6N1P versus other compatible preamp tubes like the 6DJ8. And that is that the 6N1Ps generally are considered to be a very clean, fairly transparent sounding tube, but on top of that they're also very low in microphonics, and this is where one of the key points in the tube rolling journey comes in. I had a channel patron send me a selection of 7062 tubes, both the standard straight version and what they call the pinched waist version. And I did have a play around with those, both in the preamp sockets and also in the power sockets, and that was using tube adapters, so things like 
these here. So you do need an adapter because the pinouts are different. So you can't plug it directly in or you do risk blowing up the amp or the tube. I haven't tried it, so I can't tell you which one's going to blow. But the point is I tried the 7062s and what I found was that in the input sockets, there's definitely some value in them, but also some drawbacks. The problem was that when I put them in the output stage, I found that their high output impedance started to mess a bit more with the tonality of the headphones and I wasn't always a fan. I'm not for a second going to sit here and say you shouldn't try this for yourself. Some of the combinations were still quite wonderful, but in the end, I personally decided to only focus my rolling on the preamp stage. And there's two reasons for that. One of them is that you need eight different tubes in the back of the amp, and that can get very expensive with a tube like the 7062. And then the other reason was that I didn't want to mess with the output impedance of the Folkvanger when it's already moderately high. And so let's talk now about some tube rolling only in the front slot here. And the first tube I started with, because it was the one that I happened to have in there when I started making my notes, was that straight 7062 I mentioned before. For all this testing, I stuck to the same track, so I had a consistent point of reference, and the track I landed on was Cliché by James Vincent McMorrow. And what I heard from the 7062 straight tubes in the preamp slot was a lot of transformer hum. And that's where one of the issues comes up with tube rolling, is that you're probably going to want to focus on getting non-microphonic tubes, and the 7062s unfortunately are quite microphonic. Add to that the fact that I get a tiny amount of transformer hum in my Folkvanger. I don't know if you do, if you own one. Let us know in the comments down below if yours has a slight hum. But I've definitely found that mine does. And so what was happening was that that hum, which is essentially a vibration in the transformer, was carrying through the chassis or the circuit boards and getting into the tube socket, vibrating the tubes, and therefore transmitting the tube hum directly into the output stage. Once I was able to fiddle around a bit and minimize the hum, and I struggled to ever completely get rid of it, but once the music kicked in and the hum was low enough that I didn't hear it, or once I fiddled around and occasionally was able to get it to basically disappear altogether, what I heard from the 7062 straight was a vocal that was very focused, very intimate, so it was quite kind of up close to me but sounded wonderful, and a good sense of punch and control on the bass. Overall separation of sounds was strong, and sounds like cymbals and snares were crisp and textured, but generally pretty smooth as well. And so overall, having started with the 7062 as my baseline, it was a lovely sound. It had been a while since I'd specifically listened to the 6N1Ps, which are the stock tubes, and so for me, the 7062 became my reference point. And I'm kind of glad that I went that way, because then when I went back to the 6N1P, which is the stock tube, I was actually able to hear its benefits. And sometimes what happens when we tube roll is that we kind of set our baseline as the stock tubes and assume that everything we're going to add in there is going to be an improvement, and that's not always the case. In this case, it was definitely an improvement for me going from the 7062 back to the stock. And I should mention, the stock tubes provided by shit aren't the basic, lowest level generic tubes. The 6N1Ps delivered here have the OTK stamp, which from doing some reading is one of the better variants of the tubes. And indeed, their sound for me was an upgrade over the straight 7062. The vocal that I mentioned before is a bit more detailed and clean now, so I'm hearing a bit more texture in it, as well as still an excellent sense of focus. And the sense of overall separation of sounds is also better. The percussion is cleaner and more defined from the 6N1Ps. And the sound was overall more articulate, kind of less thick, and just generally preferable. So on this occasion, I think the stock tubes are better than that particular option of tube rolling, but I've got two other tubes that I want to talk about because I tried a few. And the next one was the pinched waist version of that same 7062 tube that I started with, but it does sound a bit different. It comes across a little bit cleaner sounding than the straight version. And whilst it's still thicker and richer than the 6N1Ps, it's managing to balance sort of a halfway point between the two. And what I mean is between the straight 7062 and the 6N1P. So it's giving you a little bit more richness and thickness and body than the 6N1P, but it's not completely trading that off and taking away the sense of texture and clarity. So it's kind of like it's maintaining the same level of texture and clarity as the 6N1P, but just giving you a bit more body underneath. It makes for some really nice vocal deliveries, this being the pinched waist version of the 7062, because it's giving you a sense of kind of richness and body and presence in the vocals, but it's still maintaining that texture and clarity up top, whereas I think the straight version got just a little bit smooth sometimes. And so for me, after trying all three, I don't know that I would buy the 7062 straight, but definitely I can see a reason why getting the 7062 pinched waist as an alternative to the 6N1Ps could be a good choice. Particularly if you've got a headphone that needs that bit of extra body and weight, so like an HD800 for instance. For me, listening largely with the atriums and also the Verite Opens, I didn't feel the need for that extra body and weight. The 6N1P was just enough. But if I did have HD800s, I could absolutely see myself wanting something like the pinched waist 7062. 
So I think both are good. Do be aware of microphonics with the 7062s. I found it a little bit easier to deal with in the pinched waist version than the straight version, but that also could be the specific variants of the tubes themselves. In other words, just a unit to unit change. And so after playing with the 7062s that needed adapters, the other thing I wanted to try was a tube that was a straight plug and play. And so I went out and bought myself a pair of NOS Amperex 6DJ8 Bugle Boys. Something I noticed with these was that once again, they produced a bit of hum in the Falkvanger. And I think again, it was picking up that vibration coming from the transformer, which is a real shame. If that transformer hum wasn't there, then these microphonic tubes would probably be much easier to work with. But even going beyond the hum, what I found from the 6DJ8 was it was kind of like another halfway step again. And what I mean specifically is that it's still a little bit richer and fuller sounding than the 61NP in the Falkvanger, but it doesn't go quite as far as the pinched waist 7062. So it's slightly fuller and richer sounding than the stock tubes, but it's still maintaining an excellent sense of clarity and definition in the sound too. Probably the best way I can illustrate it is that in the track I mentioned before, which was Cliché by James Vincent McMorrow, there's a kick bass throughout that. It might actually be an electronic kick bass, but as that kick bass plays, going from the 6N1P to the 6DJ8, with the Amperex Bugle Boy version at least, what I was hearing was it was like the kick bass was now less damped. And so if it was an acoustic kick bass drum, it was like someone had just ever so slightly loosened off the skins. It gave it a bit more rumble, a little bit less punch overall, and it made the bass fuller as a result, whilst everything else higher up stayed about the same as what I was hearing from the 6N1P. There was a slightly different spatial presentation to it, but it was kind of hard to lock down. It was interesting, not necessarily better, but just a bit different. But ultimately for me, I kept coming back to the 6N1Ps as my clearly preferred sound. Things like the sound of the closed hi-hat in this track cliche was more natural and more true to life, based on what I've experienced at least, from the stock tubes than it was from any of the ones I rolled. Certainly rolling the tubes brought some interesting character and some interesting sound, but none of them seemed as natural to me. And so after playing around a bit, where I've landed is I've gone out and ordered some other 6N1Ps to try a bunch of the different 6N1P variants, but I don't really have any interest now in going beyond the 6N1Ps. I did play with the 7062s as power tubes, and they again brought some different characters, but I don't know that I'd say any of them was clearly better. And do keep in mind that you do have to buy adapters for every single one of those that you want to use, being the 7062s. And then you're also raising the output impedance, which could start to change for better or worse, the frequency response of your headphones. And so I'm certainly not sitting here saying don't do the rolling, but my point is if you don't want to have to go down the path of tube rolling, what I can say to you now is that having tested the stock tubes in the Falkvanger, I think it's a wonderful setup straight out of the box, and it's actually preferable to anything I've tried so far. And so to bring all this to a close, the Falkvanger here is a truly unique amp. I snapped one of these up because it's literally a once in a lifetime amp potentially. To be both output transformerless and output capacitorless requires some really unique design. There's obviously those protection circuits I mentioned before. And so if you are in a position where there's any of these left and you want to buy one, or if you're looking at buying one second hand, I can highly recommend it as an amp that you're probably never going to hear anything quite like it anywhere else. As I said before, it offers a sense of kind of transparency or connection to the sound that I have never heard from any other transformer coupled or solid state amps. It's not the last word in resolution or absolute accuracy of signal, but at the same time, it's so much fun and so engaging that I don't really care. And for me, when you pair up the Falkvanger with a great set of headphones like the ZMFs, like some of the Sennheisers, you're in for an absolute sonic treat. It's just fluid, enjoyable, engaging. And it's one of those headphone amps that when you get it with the right pairing in the right system, it can just absolutely drag you into the music and keep you there for hours on end. And so again, if you happen to be in the market for one of these, if there are any left at the time this review comes out, then I do recommend snapping one up while you can. And if you happen to find one come up second hand on the market, then it's also one I'd recommend grabbing. But this review has clearly gone on too long now. My light behind me has just switched itself off because it's taken me ages to record this. I've had lots of interruptions today. So for now, let me just say, if you found the review useful, interesting, and helpful in any way, I'd love it if you hit the like button and consider subscribing and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music before any more lights switched off, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.